well, thank you for joining this uh, in-depth session uh, where we'll discuss the challenges uh, associated with testing photonic integrated circuits. I uh, know Simon and, and Stephen and Sophie spent a, a little time uh, describing uh, this type of technologies or potential of that technology. So we'll, uh, we'll go in-depth in uh, about that. Uh, so joining me today are two experts uh, uh, coming from do, two different backgrounds. Uh, first of all, I have uh, Sebastian Giesman. So uh, hello, uh, hello, Sebastian. <laughs> How are you? Hello, Francois. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Good. So Sebastian is a product marketing manager at the MPI Corporation, responsible for probe systems, uh, product mar marketing, and uh, specialization on silicon photonics testing, uh, as we'll discuss uh, a little bit later on. Uh, Sebastian holds an uh, electrical engineering degree from Dresden University of Applied Science, and he held various positions in R&D, ap application support, and uh, product management. So that helps a lot, uh, understanding the needs uh, from uh, the, the lab and manufacturing. Uh, but mostly it was, I think, in the, the semiconductor test industry, but now moving into the silicon photonics. Um, so scheduled also for this talk, I had Lawrence van der Vecht. Uh, Lawrence is a subject matter expert based in the US and involved in uh, the PIC technology uh, for probably the past decade now. Um, but Lawrence couldn't make it live uh, to this event. And now we'll hear from uh, virtual Lawrence instead. So uh, at some point we'll have La virtual Lawrence giving us uh, some advice on um, how to test uh, these, uh, these devices. So myself, I'm Francois Cooney, Product Land Manager at Expo, uh, responsible for the line of product uh, being discussed during the, the, that session. So don't hesitate to ask questions to Sebastian or myself uh, via the chat on your Teams interface. Uh, or you can also use a raise hand if uh, you have a, a burning question. Uh, we'll try to take as many questions as, as possible during, uh, during this event. And finally, uh, bear in mind that this session will last for 30 minutes and then it will be given another, uh, another time once more um, in about 30 minutes time. So that way you can attend two sessions uh, of your choosing. And to do that, you just refer to the, uh, um, the event platform uh, for more information about the, uh, the other in-depth sessions that you have. This session is recorded and uh, will be available uh, on demand on the platform for months to come. So, um, so there we go. So let's start with uh, a little interesting statement, I think, from uh, Anders uh, Andai from uh, uh, Huawei Technology Sweden. And by the way, he's not the only one making this statement, okay? Uh, data center electricity use is likely to increase about 15-fold by 2030 to 8% of the projected worldwide demand, okay? So, um, and that projection is also backed up by this article. Um, from Nature, where um, it, it is indicated that simply scaling up uh, the current technological solutions to address the increase in traffic that we are seeing, um, the telecom industry as a whole will use up a quarter of all electricity worldwide. And, uh, and so you can't continue on this exponential uh, trend. Uh, and here it's only um, 2030, but if you keep going in that way, you'll use up all of the energy by uh, 2050 or so. So the upcoming challenge is huge because within 10 years or not even 10 years, uh, we need to come up with new solutions for, uh, uh, and at least for the telecoms, uh, to be researched, developed, put through production, packaged and sold. Uh, and all that uh, to uh, unprecedented scale and obviously with as little impact uh, on cost to the end customer as possible. So from a, at least from a photonics uh, front, we need to have new components that are more efficient, compact, cheaper, more robust even. 
And so obviously uh, the photonic integrated uh, circuits uh, are help at hand uh, for this development, at least once again on the photonics front. Uh, so these PIC are uh, compact devices, compact chips. Um, they can have up to hundreds, even thousands of components or, or uh, optical functions onto them. And the advantage is that you can have active or passive components, so things that emit light or modify the light. Uh, and these can consume as little power as possible, but also they are easier to fabricate because you fabricate them on a the, on the wafer. And so the manufacturability is faster, it is better. You can deal with larger volumes at a, a lower cost. And you can even think about integrating the best of both worlds, the electronics and the photonics part. So um, here I have uh, the, the slogan uh, uh, from, uh, is deri derived from Daft Punk, they are French, I know. Smaller, faster, denser, greener, cheaper. This is what, uh, what we can hope to do with, uh, with uh, this uh, peak technology. And this is not just related to telecoms and, and data comms or data centers. Uh, these key advances are being made in many domains uh, thanks to this peak. Uh, take LiDAR, for example. You can make LiDAR for autonomous car lighter and cheaper, more compact, and to the cost of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what is required for the uh, uh, automotive uh, um, industry medical applications where you could have a lab on the chip that is, you know, in, inserted into your skin and you just uh, have it checked every now and then. Uh, or quantum computing, quantum photonics, uh, very powerful here at creating very complicated devices on a single chip. So the advantage of the large volume, the reproducibility of the chips also makes it ideal for consumer market usage because you can make millions of these chips. And then once again, the more you make, the lower the cost of these chips is. So uh, in terms of energy efficiency, once again here, we can, we can still have advantages in all, these, uh, in all these technologies. But, and there is always a, a, a but here, is that um, all is not blue in the uh, sky of peak. And when it comes to testing, it is quite of a challenge, actually, as uh, there are two challenges. Uh, one is uh, the, the alignment process, and Stefan will, uh, sorry, Sebastian will, um, will touch uh, about it. But also there is a testing part, and there are some challenges associated with this. So uh, let's join now uh, virtual Lawrence, uh, who will tell us more about what these uh, challenges are. And if you can't hear virtual Lawrence, uh, let me know and I will check that he can hear him. Uh, thanks, Francois. Uh, let me start off by apologizing for not being here in person uh, caused by unforeseen uh, last hour changes. Uh, not something that I anticipated, but uh, I guess that's the, that's the nature of the business. But um, as Francois mentioned here, looking at slide number seven, uh, PIC technology is quite broad and it is a technology that uh, can be used for many different type of applications and industries. But no matter the application, the bulk of the cost, as, as stated on this slide here, um, can be found in, in testing the device. And here a conservative number of 30% is, uh, is mentioned, but uh, again, being conservative here, um, a more realistic number or not a number that surprises us is, is found around 50 to 70% or even 80% of, of making the device. Um, which is which is substantial, of course. Um, so the cost of testing the uh, the, uh, the the device is multifaceted, meaning that the uh, the tip typically gets tested at every stage of the echo chain. Um, there are there are three stages uh, shown here, but um, depending on the process that one um, could follow, it, it it could be uh, there could be more steps in between. So at the design level, and um, you know, it's typically where the device gets tested as a proof of concept. Uh, then going through further through the echo chain is at the foundry at, and at the wafer disk level. Uh, the next step would be mass production. And once the, uh, the wafer has been cut, out, cut into bars and dies, 
is where it gets tested. And then finally, at the point where the uh, the chip gets gets packaged, is is another stage where the uh, where the device gets tested. Um, so at each stage in in this echo chain, every port on every pick gets tested multiple times. Uh, this to ensure that the, uh, the the measurement results are uh, repeatable and accurate, um, which is of course uh, one of the testing objectives, uh, which I'm going to touch uh, touch on uh, in the next slide. And um, you know this um, this echo chain is not necessarily followed by just one company, but by multiple companies, which which poses another challenge. Uh, so to drawing a conclusion on the actual performance of the device requires one to cross correlate every set of data on every single pick component for final quality insurance and an actual pass fail of the device. Um, so there's an enormous amount of data that needs to be processed and, and cross correlated just to make sure that whatever is being tested um, makes sense. So bringing the, uh, the testing of the, uh, the pick into uh, to perspective, um, slide eight um, shows really the challenges and objectives and um, summarizing what, what most PIC companies are, are being faced with. Um, so for the sake of keeping the overall testing time to a bare minimum, one should always run a measurement once to come to um, accurate results. Um, you only want to do it once and not multiple times, which will um, you know, cost more. Um, so the obvious way to test this is by running multiple measurements to ensure repeatability. But this is something one would, wouldn't have to do 100 times on the same device uh, to prove once uh, you know, the device's accuracy. Um, you know, once it's been um, proven, then you know, it, it, it's pretty much carved in stone and making it repeatable for the, for the other devices on that same disk. So Axfo has a unique method, which is based on the Mikkelsen interferometer that uh, assures a, a wavelength accuracy of plus minus five picometers or even lower with, uh, with the use of an external um, acetylene gas cell. Um, so part of the accuracy topic is dynamic range, which again makes the actual system unique to the market. Um, Francois, I know further down, will, uh, will explain um, a few of the products that are being used in this, uh, in this uh, PIC setup. Uh, an OPM-based system with one dynamic range setting rules out any possible anomalies uh, caused by auto ranging of uh, um, optical power meters, which is something one could interpret as an issue with the, uh, with the pick under test. So having a power meter with one clean dynamic range um, really helps getting a clean and a one-time scan result that, uh, that makes sense. So the total cost of testing the, uh, the pick device uh, being in the order of 30% or more requires this um, defines really the, the speed of the system and uh, this is not just the uh, the test instrumentation that's being used but also the alignment which of course takes time of the system going in probing into the PIC and out of the PIC this alignment process needs to be uh, needs to be fast too um, so on the instrumentation side this would mean um, or would require a fast sweeping laser source or laser sources depending on what wavelength range or ranges need to be covered. And on the power meter side, it would require a fast uh, data acquisition system, um, which is also something that Expo has uh, unique uh, solutions to offer. Um, so not every PIC device is the same, which means that different instrumentation is needed. And depending on what the testing needs of a given PIC device is, would require different instrumentation. So having a modeler system or setup uh, would allow one to make hardware modifications and changes as needing as needed without spending a, spending a ton of money. So a modeler setup, um, you know, similar to the CTP-10, uh, would allow for adding new functionality and, and, uh, and functions over time um, based on how the, uh, the market evolves and based on what kind of parameters would need to be tested on the, on the pick under test. Uh, lastly, on this on this slide, automation plays a, a very very big role in addressing the speed and scalability, um, which is something addressed by the GOI that we have as part of the CTP10 or OSA24 active device measurements. Uh, but also, we collaborated with a, a third-party wafer disk handler system like a manufacturer like MPI, 
and with uh, with a software company by the name of Eva E H V A, and um, on the automation part, there will be a dedicated test talk addressing just particular that particular topic. Um, so feel free to uh, sign up on for that um, uh, test talk, which is scheduled for um, April the 22nd, called uh, test talk number two. Slide nine uh, shows the measurement taken on an, on a particular pick based Max Xander modulator, um, both on the physical performance and, and traffic, so actual usage performance. Uh, the physical performance, as shown it on the bottom right, shows how the optical spectrum of a Max Xander modulator changes based on the different voltage settings applied to the arms of the modulator. Um, so running a, an optical scan at different voltage settings. Um, shows you the different uh, behavior uh, or, or changes within the max on the modulator. Um, so measuring an optical spectrum as shown here would require a tunable laser source and, and an optical power meter system. Again, something that uh, Francois, Francois will go into uh, depth on in the next uh, couple of slides. So actual function or traffic testing requires products like a, a bit error rate tester to apply a certain bit, adder, bit pattern going through the optical path of the max modulator and having a part of like a, an optical spoke scope or uh, eye analyzer at the other end to look at the uh, the cleanness of the of the eye diagram again also here francois will be spending a few words on the instrumentation uh, that actual offers um, addressing these uh, these measurements so this brings me to my last slide uh, which showcases the a fully automated turnkey photonic integrated test system uh, with optical instrumentation from AXFO. Uh, wafer this technology by our uh, collaborator Hewlett Packard Enterprises and the actual wafer disk handler system by, uh, by MPI. Uh, that concludes it for me. Uh, thank you and uh, hereby back to uh, Francois. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Virtual Laurent. Um, so, um, Sebastian, we can clearly see on the on this slide here the, the setup for the, the probe station, uh, which is one of the, the the key piece of equipment that you require to couple light into into the device for uh, uh, the wafer level peak testing. Um, maybe you can tell us a, a little bit more about this. Correct. Thank you very much. What we see here is a very typical setup on a 300 millimeter probe station. And as Lawrence already mentioned, this was done in a project where we collaborated with Expo for the measurement part and uh, Hewlett Packard Enter Enterprises, uh, which provided the um, devices to be tested. And we actually did everything around the positioning, so the, the core competence of, the, um, the probe of our probe station company. So as I already mentioned, that's a 300 millimeter system. It's a semi-automatic system. That means we will load the wafer manually, and then we can automatically step through a wafer, align the fibers, and test the full wafer automatically. This uh, setup is also available in a 200 millimeter version, so for smaller wafers and is also available with an additional loading option. Then in this case, we would have a fully automated system where the uh, wafers can be loaded onto the chuck automatically. We see uh, here in the center, there are two positioners. In this case, we have two hexapod positioners. This is the uh, most advanced and most flexible solution. It is recommended for everything where we need to adjust angles which is uh, especially the case for testing with fiber arrays, where we uh, need to overcome the uh, fiber array misalignment to the device. There are also more simple solutions available where we have, for instance, instead of the um, hexapod, we have just a motorized X, Y, Z positioner, which does the course positioning. Then, uh, Yes, this is a pure optical to optical setup where we see in the back here and uh, the laser sources and the optical power meter from Expo. This was the requirement in this case for this device. It's certainly possible to do also uh, a combination with electrical measurements. In this case, we just need additional positioners for, for instance, RF or DC applications. On the two screens here, we see um, 
One uh, or the, the lower screen is for operating the probe station. This is uh, required during the setup. And for the uh, automation, we can completely remote control the um, probe station and also the measurement instruments. On the upper screen, the um, results are displayed. In this case here, we're doing an IL measurement sweep and we step from device to device. So to automate this, we um, have the ability to do this, like in this case here, with Python scripts. But we also came up with a nice solution with a test executive where we also collaborate with our partners. And this test executive is now available to do this kind of measurement me measurements in the optical setup. And it's called a Meshmatic. So this is available now. On the uh, next slide, we actually uh, recorded a video to show how a such setup is done. So this is a video provided uh, from Expo where we uh, put everything together, what has been done. It starts with a nice sentence from Ashkan. I can design and manufacture any PIC device I like, but testing is costly and time consuming. So this is uh, very true. And um, Lawrence has already talked about this in more detail. So what we have done here is uh, first we see an overview of the probe station. So that's exactly the, the setup we have done. It's a 300 millimeter probe station where we have the laser source and the optical power meter here in the back connected to the fibers. The uh, wafer is loaded onto the chuck, in this case manually. And then we see here the um, fibers in more detail. So there are two fiber holders. And now we are stepping through the device. So same setup here with the upper screen for the measurements. Here we see the stepping of the wafer, how the uh, fibers are scanning each side. And then uh, we see it here in the microscope view for the input and the output fiber. And the light intensity is recorded at all time because we want the maximum during the alignment, the light intensity. So this would be the X4 measurement screen where we do the wavelength sweep. And this is a typical result for the, um, for the measurement, for the IL measurement in this case. And then the stepping is done with the individual fibers in the device. This is when the positional moves. There is another fine alignment done and then we can do the next measurement. And the next measurement then is also collected with the um, uh, expo measurement system. So here we saw a stepping to the next device. This is when the wafer moves and then the curve here gets overlaid. We can zoom in, we can analyze here. So and look at uh, two different devices. Yo, that's already the video. Thank you, Francois. OK, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Sebastian, it's it's interesting to see that even just simply coupling the light in and out of uh, of these components uh, on the wafer requires really specialist equipment, um, and that's why it's important to work together to find solutions because uh, uh, we need specialists in each of these uh, these areas. And uh, as mentioned by uh, by Lawrence uh, earlier on, Expo also offers a, a range of uh, tests instrumentation uh, geared for peak testing. So really keeping speed and accuracy in mind at all uh, at all time. And um, we have discussed quite extensively uh, about uh, the passive optical component tester. So things that are going to transform light, but not necessarily emit light uh, with the CTP-10 uh, that we have seen in the video. But we can also um, run some tests on uh, devices that emit the light. And uh, in that case, you would require an optical spectrum analyzer, such as the OSA-20, that can uh, scan up to 2,000 nanometers per second, which means that you can have many, uh, many scans per second uh, for alignment purposes and even for testing. It is uh, one of the fastest OSAs on the market today. Uh, but going even further, with that, uh, you can on the wafer perform some functional testing, uh, such as eye diagram with a sampling scope or a bit array testing. And in that case, uh, Expo has uh, made the acquisition of InOptical, and InOpticals is, is uh, specialized in these type of instrument with a BA4000, EA4000 
Once again, keeping speed and accuracy and quality of measurement in mind. Uh, so these complete the, uh, the proposition for a peak testing solution uh, at Expo. And so I hope that um, we gave you a, a, a glimpse of uh, the challenges and the solutions uh, that we face when uh, uh, testing PIC. Uh, so um, what's next? So we'll um, go into a question time right now. Uh, if uh, I have not checked the, um, the chat, but if you have a question, you can either type it in in the chat or uh, I think the, uh, that we can uh, we can take a live question if you fancy uh, just asking it uh, orally. Just uh, let us know. I uh, actually had one question for for you, uh, uh, Sebastian. Um, you talked about uh, the, the different sizes of uh, of the, the 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 wafers that you can you can handle, but uh, I know that on, on some of the devices, uh, the, the temperature of uh, of the test that is uh, performed uh, is also quite important. So, do you control the the, the temperature on the wafer during the test? Yes. This is also possible. There are room temperature applications and this probe station can be equipped with a room temperature chuck where the wafer is placed on, but there are also thermal options available. And these thermal options, they have uh, there are different uh, possibilities. You can start with uh, like room temperature to 200 degrees C and then you go lower. When you have the requirement, this can be upgraded in the field. And the um, available temperature range for this kind of testing is from minus 40 degrees C up to 200 degrees C. Mm. And we have actually customers uh, using this system from, from minus 40 up to a little bit over 100. So this is uh, already in the field what, what customers are using. Oh, OK. <laughs> I, I did not think that you had to go to 100 degrees, but <laughs> it's depend on the uh, specific uh, requirements where these uh, these uh, peaks are used in. So uh, there are these kinds of temperature ranges they need to be um, tested in. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you do. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks. Any uh, additional questions from the audience? Well, if not, then I'll um, I'll jump onto a few information additional to what we have shown right now. Let me just share my screen again. So you may have noticed at the bottom of the um, uh, of the page uh, for this in-depth uh, discussion. There, is, there are some um, related resources uh, that could be inter interesting to, to dive into that. We have a blog, white papers, uh, also additional videos uh, going further into the description of uh, what, what we've discussed uh, today. Uh, but obviously in half an hour, there's uh, very little time to discuss in depth uh, all the uh, ins and outs of uh, peak testing. And so that's why we de dedicating one full session uh, next week, April 22nd, uh, with uh, industry leaders once again discussing how to future proof pig testing uh, and also with in depth um, technical discussions based on automation, how pig uh, are um, used in transceivers, and also next gen component testing. And obviously, this doesn't stop here. As uh, Sophie mentioned during the panel discussion, we also have uh, another event centered around 400 gigs and beyond uh, relating to transceiver and the new era of the transceiver. Once again, with in-depth uh, technical uh, sessions, one about 800 gigs, PAM, PAM4, one about coherent optics or things that uh, um, Simon and uh, Stephen discussed uh, earlier on. And the last of the session, the, the test talk number four, will be centered around, uh, around 5G challenges. And once again here, from R&D to field deployment with uh, in-depth technical sessions around all things doing with 5G. So on that, uh, I will thank you again, Sebastian, for joining.
welcome. And uh, thank you for um, attending. And right now, if you want to jump to another session for uh, the second part, or if you want to stay for exactly the same, you're welcome as well. All right, take care and goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. So we we'll wait for about a minute for people to, new people to join. Uh, and let me just reset my... Uh,